Well, thank you very, very much. I uh, want to say a word of greeting, not only to uh, all of the parents that are here and students for a weekend, the student body, uh, Jerry Falwell, what this school has meant to me. His father was such an a absolute hero. It's amazing how I find myself on such a regular basis quoting uh, Dr. Falwell and the influence he had in my life at even this university. Had a daughter that attended here. My son-in-law attended this school as well. And it's been a great deal to me. So to the faculty, student body, and everyone that's here, what a joy to be here. I'm going to speak for a few minutes this morning on the subject of John chapter 17. And I want to talk about a supreme passion for the glory of God. Thank you, Johnny Moore, for inviting me to come. Uh, I only have a few minutes after I speak. Uh, we have a lady that was 98 years old in good health, was in a car accident at the first of the week and uh, lost her life. But what a way to go at 98. And so I'd always promised this sweet lady I would do her service. And so I'm grateful that it made it possible for me to get here, get home in time to do that. John chapter 17. Now listen to why this is such an important and pivotal passage. It records the longest the longest prayer we have anywhere of Jesus praying. And to think that he made his prayer public so we could listen in to what he is saying. In this particular prayer, he does three things. In John 17 in verses 1 through 5, he prays first of all for himself. And his, his prayer for himself is that he would do the will of God in such a way that his Father would be glorified in heaven. Here's what I know about Jesus. Jesus emulated everything he ever exhorted. Jesus never asked us to ever do anything he had not already done himself. And so what a model he is. And so he desired to bring glory to his Father. So he prayed for himself that he would be glorified and as a result, the Father in heaven would be glorified. Then in verses 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples, namely he prays for us. It is remarkable to listen in and hear what Jesus is praying to his Father for us. And then in verses 20 through 26, he actually prays for those that haven't even come to believe yet. So here's what you need to know. Occasionally someone may say, you know, I'm at Liberty University. Uh, I've not made a commitment possibly to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And some of these people are praying for me and they encourage me. But I want to say something else to you. Based on the authority of God's Word, John chapter 17, verse number 20, Jesus is praying for those that don't believe. If you go to hell when this life is over, it will simply be because you were not willing to heed the prayer that the Son of God prayed on your behalf. He didn't just die for you, was buried for you, rose from the dead for you. He's praying for you. And so listen to these words in the first five verses. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, and by the way, He's in the upper room, we believe. Soon he will cross the Kidron Valley. He'll make his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Within 24 hours of this prayer, Jesus would be on the cross and there in Calvary. And so just before going there, he prays, Father, the hour has come. And he's referring to the hour that came that was really his hour, the express purpose of why he came. He says, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And let me go a step further. Not only is Jesus desired that the Father glorify him so he can glorify the Father, but he also goes a step further and he prays that we be glorified in the Son so that we too may glorify the Father. We hear so much about the glory of God. People are always saying, man, I want God to be glorified. We sing so many songs about God's glory. What is God's glory? How does a person glorify God? What does it look like if you choose the right decision in your life, and that is to live for the supreme passion of the glory of God? And then he says that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority, that is God has given the Lord Jesus authority over all flesh, all humankind, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. 
And this is eternal life. Listen to this bold statement. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. I I would like to say that at the end of my life. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to say, I have glorified you here on earth. I have done that which you have given me to do. And I'm of the personal conviction that you are here by divine design. God has a sovereign purpose for your life, and he gives you sovereign power to carry it out. See, I believe at the judgment seat of Christ for Christians, we will actually give an account of what we did with what Jesus gave us to do it with. And so he said, I've accomplished what you have given me to do. And then in verse number five, he says, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus is reminding us of John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, that's the Son of God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so he's reminding him that I've come here to do your will. Jesus, Jesus was willing to lay aside his glory, clothe himself in human flesh, to come into this world to glorify the Father, and accomplished the purpose of the cross so that we could know him. But he knew that when this life was over, after he'd accomplished that purpose, he was going right back to the Father in order to retain that seat at the right hand of the Father in glorifying him as the very Son of God. And so Jesus, his prayer was all about the supreme passion of the glory of God. See, the cross displayed God's glory like no other event in human history. It revealed God's righteousness, his justice, and his holiness in requiring that the blood of an innocent person be shed, that namely of his son, a lamb unblemished, without spot. Listen to this. The New Testament word is that he may become the propitiation, which means the covering for the wrath of God. Basically, God is a God of justice. God is a God of holiness. And God knew that we had sinned, all of us. We were born sinners. By choice, we are sinners. And the wrath of God was gonna be poured out on our sins. And so God, in the person of Jesus Christ, clothed himself in flesh, came into this world, and here's what he did. He made his place between sinners and the heavenly Father. So when the wrath of God fell, that's what Calvary's all about. The wrath of God fell on the Lord Jesus so that he could become the covering for us, the propitiation for us, so that if we would receive his forgiveness, receive the gift of eternal life, the wrath of God would not be aborted, ladies and gentlemen. The wrath of God would be absorbed by Jesus Christ. He took it in himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that you and I might become the righteousness of God in him. Let me tell you what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus received something from us he did not have, namely sin. Jesus on the cross gave us something that we not have, namely righteousness. Here's the bottom line of the gospel. It was so necessary that Jesus accomplished God's perfect will on the cross by glorifying the Father, by being obedient to Calvary, because there was no way any of us could ever go to heaven on our own merit and our own goodness. The only reason anyone will ever go to heaven is because God gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The divine requirement for heaven is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God made that available in his son, the Lord Jesus. So so let me just talk about a couple of things in this brief time I have with you. First of all, let, let me magnify the sovereign power of God the Father. Uh, God, our Father, has given Jesus, God the Son, authority to grant eternal life. Remember what the Bible said in John 1, 12? But as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the power, the authority to become the sons of God to those who believe in his name. So on the basis of Calvary, the finished work, as a result of what he did, you and I as believers have the gift of eternal life. The word give is used 17 times in this particular prayer. Uh, Seven times Jesus states that believers, this is really good, believers are the Father's gift to the Son. Now, we're accustomed to thinking of Jesus 
as the Father's love gift to us. And that's true, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So a love gift from God the Father to us is the Lord Jesus. But please hear this. You want to know how much you're worth? You want to know how God places just infinite worth on every single one of you? The Bible teaches that you are God the Father's gift to God the Son. And that's why Jesus had to die on the cross. God the Father gave them to him, but they had to be purchased on the cross. I've had the joy of being married to my wife, Janet, for 41 years. Gosh, that's hard to believe. I mean, when you get married, you think 41 years. I mean, I don't even feel like I'm 41 years old, but nonetheless, I am. And listen to this, it's amazing. Now, remember what I just told you. I told you that the Bible teaches that God the Father gave you to God the Son as a gift. I'm telling you, God is flat in the gift-giving business. He has so much your needs and your heart, even on his heart. Proverbs 19, 14 says, houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife, or might I add, a prudent spouse is from the Lord. God, God not only gave me his son, and not only did God the Father give me to his son as a gift, then God, not only after changing my life, God gave me my wife. So the father gave his son the authority to give eternal life to those whom the father gave to the son. And so from a human viewpoint, we received the gift of eternal life when we believe on Jesus. In my life, that was on a snowy Sunday night in Wilmington, North Carolina, Longleaf Baptist Church. I'd never been to a Sunday evening service in my life. I was managing a pool room. I was a high school dropout. My dad left when I was seven. I was raised in a project and I stayed in and out of trouble, but somebody loved me enough to invite me to church. And just for the record's sake, 96% of the people that will ever go to church will go in the arm of a friend, a relative, a work associate, classmate, or neighbor. And so a friend invited me to church. I heard the gospel. I'd never owned a Bible. I'd never been in a Sunday school class, never attended a revival service. And I heard a clear message of the gospel, how God loved me and how Christ died for me. And even though I didn't understand, couldn't have quoted John 3, 16, didn't even know about the books of the Bible. For the first few months when I was in church, I had to just turn to the table of content and wait for the preacher to tell us where the book was so I could find the page number and find it there. But I went to church on that Sunday night. And the reason I went on Sunday night is God had exposed my need for him. And just for the record's sake, you need to pray because nobody can turn the lights on. Nobody can raise the blinds. Nobody can make you aware of your need for Jesus. But God the Spirit and the gospel. And so the gospel was preached. God the Holy Spirit exposed my needs. Now, before God exposed my needs, I spent most of my time comparing myself to other friends. My attitude was, well, if he's going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. But what I realized is that you don't go to heaven because you're better than another person. You go to heaven because you come to realize that God gave his only dear son that came to glorify his father on the cross and that he took my place there. He received the just punishment that I deserved. Uh, he died, but he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he got up from the dead, and he's alive this morning, and he can enter our life, and we can know him in a personal and wonderful, wonderful way. And so this passage magnifies God's sovereignty in salvation. So the fact that Jesus Christ alone was given authority to grant eternal life, his death on the cross, underscores the exclusivity of the gospel. It is only through him that eternal life will be received. One of the greatest doctrines that's going to cause all of us believers in the future, and maybe even after I'm gone off the scenes, it could happen in my lifetime, there's already trouble. But some people think that you're being rather arrogant, but it's not your saying. Last Sunday night, I was preaching at First Woodstock at the close of the service. One of the men that visits every Sunday night sits in our death section. And he's not, not able to hear, of course. And so after the service, he asked the translator to come down and talk to me. And so he comes and he debates what I've shared. But let me tell you what I salute him for. Last Sunday night, he came down. He said, let me tell you what I want to disagree with. And so the translator was telling me. I said, okay. He said, I disagree with what Nehemiah said. And I thought to myself, well, thank God 
Somebody may say, well, why were you grateful? Because normally somebody says, I disagree with what you said. But the truth is, normally what I said is not what I said, it's what he said. And I'm just saying to you what he said. So when the Bible says that God the Father gave God the Son the authority to grant eternal life, I'm not the one that said he's the only one. God the Father said only his Son. So when you start talking about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ that nobody else, nobody else can forgive your sins. Nobody else can grant you eternal life. Nobody else promises abundant life but God the Son because of God the Father. Oh, you seem so narrow. But that speaks of the sovereign power of God the Father. We see his power, but then quickly notice his personableness. In verse number three, I love this, it says, and this is eternal life. So somebody may say, do you have eternal life? Let me ask you, when this life is over, and one day it will be over, when this life is over, do you know that you'll spend eternity with the Lord? Someone says, oh, I, I think so, I hope so. One of my friends taught me over 25 years ago to always remind people when I'm preaching, eternity is too long to be wrong. And so listen to what Jesus said. This is eternal life. Let's hear from eternal life himself. I'm telling you, it is God who is eternal life and who grants eternal life. This is eternal life. That, they may know you. They may know the Lord Jesus and God the Father. The only true God, the only true God, the Bible says, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He sent him into the world. So eternal life comes only to those who know God. It implies not mere intellectual knowledge, but a deep, intimate love relationship. It's not what you know about him. You know, living in Atlanta, everybody always asks me, are you a Braves fan? You know, you, you hear so much about sports and all, and that is good. But listen to this. They act sometimes like they know some of the players personally. To hear them carry on conversation. They know about them, but the problem is the sports figure doesn't know them. And some of us have done that in our relationship with God. We talk as though we know God. We know the God talk. But when the Bible talks about knowing him, did you know the word that it uses, genisco, is a little Greek word that actually speaks of knowing him intimately like a man knows his wife in a sexual relationship. It is the deepest possible relationship there is, a deep, deep, intimate love relationship. It speaks of the personableness. Isn't this awesome to think that God loves you so much that he made a way through the Lord Jesus that he could personally know you? I mean, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, I'm glad to know Jerry Falwell. I think it's a big deal. I love him and his entire family and his mom. I love his dad and all of them. But isn't it awesome to stand here this morning? Look at me. I know God. I know God. The Bible teaches in the book of Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23. He says, listen, don't boast in your riches if you're rich. He said, but boast in this, that you know God. And, and what a great joy. Jesus said, when, when disciples came back after ministering and witnessing, he said these words to him. He said, now you have gone out and you have cast out demons, you've preached the gospel, and, and you're glorying that. He said, let me tell you what to really glory in. Glory that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So not only do I know God, my name is on his roll. My name is in God's book. And I'm telling you, I don't know of anything that could be more precious and more important than that. And so he says, this is how you really know God. And by the way, to know him is present tense because eternal life is, this is so good. It's not just a future possession. It is a present reality. It's not that one day I'm going to get eternal life. It is already mine. And by the way, you ought to understand that because the Bible says he that believeth not is condemned already. Say, say if you've got a friend that you really care a great deal for, and you say, you know, if they don't come to Christ, one day they're going to be condemned. I need to correct you. They already are. They already are. They're already in the state of condemnation. And that's why if they perish today, they would immediately be separated from the Heavenly Father. And so to know Him is a, a present tense, as eternal life, a future a possession, no, a present reality. So I enjoy eternal life now as a rich experience of God's blessings that come through our personal, intimate fellowship with Christ. But let me go a step further and talk about a supreme passion uh, for the glory of God 
you know, the glorified God was what was on Jesus' mind. Eight different times, eight times in chapter 17, he speaks of glory. Jesus desired to live his life for the glory of God. Here's a great definition of the glory of God. The glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of his manifold perfection. So, so when people speak on this platform, in your classroom, in your church, and they talk about, we want God to be glorified. Little, little course we used to sing, in my life, Lord, be glorified. In my church, Lord, be glorified. So, so here's the bottom line. What does it look like for God to be glorified? What, what do you mean when you say, I have a supreme passion for the glory of God? Uh, it speaks of God's fame. There's a song, I'm sure you sing on this platform, that says he's the famous one. He's famous because of his renown. It's because of his fame. It, it, it speaks of his honor. We want to honor God with our life. Now, you can't add anything to his glory. You can't take anything away from it. But we ought to be acknowledging it and treasuring it. God is, here it is, God is glorious. We serve a glorious God. It, it's a word that speaks of his value. It, it means that his value should be our highest treasure. Think of this. If, if you're a believer, would you say the highest treasure in your life is the glory of God? Would you say that nothing means more to you than the fact that you want to glorify him? Now, we ought to do it out of the fear of God. Now, you may say, like, I'm afraid, no, not like, a, not like a slave to a master, but like a son to a father. You just don't want to disappoint him. You want to glorify and honor his name. Here's my favorite translation. When you speak of the glory of God, it speaks of the weightiness of God. Now, think of that, the weightiness of God. That means that, it, that he, he carries more weight in your life than anyone else. Uh, nothing means more than that. Here's what's happened. Sometimes we find ourselves in sin, and the reason we do, and it becomes a habit or a stronghold in our life, is because if we're not careful, we begin to put more weight, more honor, that becomes more famous in our life than Jesus does. But when Jesus is the famous one in your life, when he's the one that carries the most weight in your life, nothing, nothing means more to you than the fact that you want to bring glory to his, his, his name. So Jesus said, I've glorified you on earth. And he, how did he glorify him? By doing what he called him to do. How did he glorify him? Listen to this, by doing the will of God. I wonder what the will of God is for your life because it's, a, it's in doing the will of God that God will be glorified in and through your life. This is gonna take a moment, but there's a missionary and he, uh, he, he preferred to re remain unnamed. And, and he wrote, I think, uh, the, the greatest statement of clarity on the glory of God I've ever heard in my life. So what I, what I need you to do is this. I need you to zero in. I'm through here in just a few moments. I, I've got to rush out, get on a plane, go back and, and be ready for a funeral service in just uh, a couple of hours. But I, I want to really kind of stick with this, this glory of God, God's sovereign power, a passion for God's glory. So, so I want you to listen to this statement this missionary wrote, and this will really say it better than I can. Real Christianity is God-centered. Uh, uh, Jesus said, said it himself that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? N nothing is more important than loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That, that means, he means, he means more to you than anyone in the whole world. It's an obsession with the glory of God. It becomes the hallmark of the true knowledge of God. The more, listen, the more you know him, the more you love him. The more you love him, the more you trust him. The more you trust him, the more you'll obey him. So, what is the glory of God? The original meaning had to do with weightiness. The glory of God summarizes the seriousness and the perfection and the infinite significance of all the attributes of God. I mean, that, you know what we've done? We've sang about the glory of God. I watched you. I watched these precious ones down here. I watched hands up all over the room, eyes closed as there was deep reflection. Some of you were reflecting on the attribute of faithfulness. Some of you just the grandeur of God, that God is so supreme over everything in the world. Uh, some of you were just magnifying his glory in a different aspect. It sums up, the glory of God sums up who he is in the awesome brightness and weightiness of all his perfections. What does it mean then for us to glorify God? We cannot add to his glory. We, he, he's already perfectly and infinitely glorious. Rather, for us to glorify God means for us to ascribe the glory that is due his name in worship. 
And, and by the way, when you think about worship, I'm not just talking about moments that are sacred. You come to the point in your life, you can't distinguish between the sacred and the secular because God is so weighty in your life. He means so much to you. There's never a time that you can separate the two. It, it, so it, it means that we acknowledge his glory by what? By living as though his perfections are as serious and significant as they really are. So that we reflect his glory through a life. Remember Jesus after the Beatitudes or, or be, right before the Beatitudes, he gave us in Matthew chapter five, he said, let others see your good works. Let your light shine that others may see your good works. Here it is. And glorify God, which is in heaven. So as God lives his life through you, others see the good works that God performed in you and God gets the glory, not us. It means that nothing horrifies us more than the thought of bringing dishonor to his glorious name. When you have a supreme passion for the glory of God, you don't want to do anything that would taint his name. I don't want to give the enemy one reason to blaspheme my heavenly father. To the contrary, I want the world somewhere or another, sometime or another, to give God the glory. And one day, all the nations will. They'll all bow before him. But we want to bring him glory. Nothing delights us more than to feel his pleasure as we live to the praise of his glory. It also means that we declare his glory among the nations. I was having lunch. I was sharing with, with uh, Mr. Falwell a moment ago. I had lunch with a young lady and her husband. They're out of our church and they're serving as missionaries in Indonesia. And we were having lunch Monday. They've been members of our church for years. They're home on a furlough. They've been there for three years in a very dark area, uh, living on very uh, meager means. And if you can only see the place where they live, but they, they don't give that a second thought. They ju they're just there to glorify God. But as we were talking, they said, Pastor, how's your schedule this week? And I said, I'm on my way to Liberty University, Lord willing, on Friday to speak. To which she said, Pastor, I can't believe you just said that. She said it was during Spiritual Emphasis Week in 1998 that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Here's a lady having lunch with me. She's serving in the largest Islamic population of the entire world. Not in the Middle East, but in Indonesia. And she's there because it was on this campus. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing to think that you may have come here thinking there's something in particular you're going to do with your life? You may leave here doing something you never thought you would do simply because, why? Because you would see the glory of God is your supreme passion and nothing would mean more to you than to say, I want to live for his renown. I don't want to live for myself. By the way, if you live for yourself, what a mighty small world. But if you live for his glory, <laughs> what a great big kingdom and what a great universe he has created and he rules. So glorifying God thus consumes and defines every aspect of our life and witness as well as our worship. So we definitely, we uh, urgently need to recapture the centrality, centrality of glorifying God. So if the glory of God is our supreme passion, this will redefine both the goals and our task and the manner in which we pursue it. Listen to this. Did you know that the God I serve has the power to so radically change an individual or individual's lives in this room that from this day forward, you would think differently about your future because you could become consumed with what you so wonderfully sing about. And that is, I want God to be glorified. And by the way, some of you, when you came here, that was your purpose. And somehow or another, it's not the school's fault, you've allowed yourself to get distracted and maybe God wants to put you right back in your pursuit of the glory of God. We, we, we are to uh, make it our task until the earth be filled with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. Let me, let me just wrap it up by saying this. When I read what I just read, I get overwhelmed with conviction in my own heart in the fact that I fall very short of my own preaching and my own counsel. That brings me to this. We can only live for his glory by his grace. And apart from his enabling us, I can do nothing. Hey, you're looking at a high school dropout. I went back to school and finished a GED at 23. My mother lived on welfare and I didn't see my dad for 20 years after he left. I was so timid and shy in the beginning of the 11th grade they told me I had to do a public book report. Port, I quit school. I said, I can't, I can't go to school and give a report. Well, how are you standing up speaking to thousands of students today and preaching to thousands at your church every Sunday? 
the enabling power of the grace of God. The Christian life is not about what you can do for God. It's what God can do through you. My passion is that God would bring you to the place that nothing would be more supreme, nothing would be weightier. When somebody says, what are you even living for? Look at me. I'm living for his renown. I want him to be famous through my life. God bless you, Liberty. Liberty.